Yeah. Thank you very much for invitation first and giving me a chance to speak about this subject. So let me first say what I'm going to talk about and then to try to put this in a slightly, in, in a kind of general perspective. So uh, it's kind of uh, motivation. Oh. So we start with x over some field f which is going to be just a regular curve. Uh, not necessarily compact, so com complete, so we can put it in some uh, uh, completed, so get projective curve. And uh, mm, then there's a complement uh, x bar minus x, and so we say this set x, s, which is uh, sitting in x of x bar of f. Uh, it's a finite set. And there is a distinguished point there as 0. And in this point, uh, we take tangent bundle at this, this point to x, uh, punch it at 0, and pick some vector here. And so to this data, one can assign uh, what's called motivic uh, pi 1 m of the curve. The curve is x. It's open curve uh, with a base point v0. So this is the length tangential point. No, I mean, uh, the set I said, yeah, you're, you're right. So it's, it's s, s0 is in x bar. So I have to put bar. Thank you. Yes. Mm? Uh, f zero is over f. f, yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't uh, all this set S is over f? Ah. Yeah. What is, huh? what is S? S is just a finite set. Yeah. So uh, you can just say this is just the complement. <laughs> uh, but you can just say you have x bar and S. All right. So uh, and if you want to look at the background. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, for, for these things uh, in different realizations and uh, compatible realizations. So there's a paper in, uh, by Deli in MSRI uh, 16. So this is roughly 87 as far as I remember. And if you go to Deli's web page, you can find it there. So don't have to find the book. So this is a background of what this means, tangential point. Uh, uh, how these things look, look together. But for us, uh, the point is uh, this is a huge uh, mixed motif. And um, so um, this means that we want to study this huge mixed motif. And now, why, why do we want to do this? So, first of all, we want to do two things about this. Um, first of all, I uh, wanted to describe. Uh, real uh, mixed Hoch structure on this pi y m. In situation, it makes sense, like when f is embedded to complex numbers, uh, in a new way. Uh, why and what I mean by this, I'll say in a second. And the second uh, thing which I want to describe is uh, some very strange relationship. So maybe I put it this part of the blackboard. So I want to study some very particular curves. And so uh, the first of them is this. So you take gm, delete nth roots of unity from here, and consider some tangential base point, which should better be called v infinity, because it's a tangential base point, tangent vector at infinity. Uh, gm sits in projective line. And so you want to consider this. Which makes complete sense. So this words about Matic fundamental group in general is not quite defined, but this, this makes complete sense. And uh, the point is that there is a very strange, I'll call this mysterious link or relationship between some little pieces of the structure of this guy and the following. So here we put geometry of uh, some modular varieties. So we put here something like 
SLM R modulo SOM symmetric space divided by some congruence subgroup gamma 1 MN. So N is an integer the same as here. Mm, and so one can call this space Y1 MN. And uh, there's some very direct uh, relation with this, which works when m is uh, 2, 3, and 4. And when n is, let's say, prime, it works very uh, precisely and explicitly. And there is a relationship in general, but uh, it's hard for me to say what happens uh, in general and how this should work. But for small m, it's very precise. And the second relationship is like that. So we take elliptic curve instead of GM. So we delete from this elliptic curve torsion points. So mu n is just torsion points in GM. And so we delete E n torsion points for some ideal. Now ideal to where? Uh, in where? So I assume that this curve has, I, I can either take integers and then no assumptions, or I can assume that there is some complex multiplication here, so I consider pi 1 of this guy. There is tangential point as well, which I don't want to mention. And then this relates. Now, the relation always goes to symmetric space. It's always symmetric space for the, so to speak, subgroup, congruent subgroup of GL related to the field. So in this case, the field was Q. In this case, the field was, let's say, Q of i. And so, uh, but in this case, we get hyperbolic threefold. Uh, so you can write them as like SL2C by SU2 by some similar congruence per group. And you can go for higher ranks as well. And uh, I wrote here Q of I not just to, be, to give an example, but because uh, actually the correspondence works the best for some special uh, imagined quadratic fields. And for others, it uh, doesn't work that much. But, but still, even for this one, there is, some, there is some very explicit correspondence. And so what they do, so you can read this diagram. Usually, I read it from the right to the left, because the right-hand side tells me about the left-hand side. So that's how it is. So usually, the, the, the information travels this way. OK, so this is the goal. So the goal is uh, basically two things. But now, why I'm doing these two things? So what's the general context for this? So is q of i is the field of complex multiplication? I mean, o of k is. Okay. Oh, I can put here z of rho, maybe some other things. But in this case, it's, it's, uh, it works exactly like, like in this case, like with the same uh, uh, pr level of precision. And actually, it's more to that. So I can consider also local systems uh, with the fibers, symmetric powers of the corresponding uh, representations on this model of varieties. It, it also, it, all of them relate to single objects on the left. All right. So now, what is the why I put these two things together? So uh, the main reason I put them together because the way uh, these things are investigated. So um, I introduced something which I called motivic correlators. And so they form a Lie algebra. Uh, Lie algebra in the category of uh, pure motives. And so they're directly related to the left-hand side. I mean, they describe the left-hand side. So this, to describe the left-hand side is basically the same thing as to explain what these motivic correlators are. But they describe it in some nice way. And on the other hand, they relate in a kind of combinatorial or geometric way to the left-hand side. And so if you want to go from the one side to the other, you're bound to go through the bottom. Now. Uh, so I'm going to, to explain what I mean by this. And uh, the good thing about them is that they have a realization. They have a Hodge realization. 
And this Hodge realization is given by this thing which I called Hodge correlators. And so it is those guys which describe uh, mixed Hodge structure over R on this motivic fundamental group. And describe in a, in a different way than <coughs> we usually do this. OK, so this is the kind of the things which I want to talk about. Already spent some time talking about this. Now let me still stay a little bit more time and try to put this in a more general framework. Mm. So here, I, I can do it this way. <coughs> So um, let's say that we have some number field, let's say Q. Then uh, in this, first of all, for any field, one can assign two things. So they are hypothetical to little extent and then to, to huge extent. And so I'm not going to discuss this. I'm going to tell them as they should be. So uh, the first one is the growth index. Uh, abelian uh, semi-simple uh, tensor category uh, of uh, pure motives. Uh, hmm? You mean no? It definitely tensor at first Q. So, so coefficients that uh, uh, is filled over Q. It could be Q, could be Q bar. Mm -hmm. I definitely do not consider anything like periodic or finite coefficients. Definitely Q. Uh, and so the pure motives over F. So they're defined, let's say, by uh, homological equivalence and uh, correspondences. This is still OK. So the next guy is mixed motives. So this is supposed to be a villain tensor category uh, of mixed motives. Over f. And here, as we know, the situation is this. So this was a big contribution of several people, and most notably of Volodya Voyevodsky. Who defines the derived category or triangulated? It's called DMF. This is this is very good, and it's actually whatever we can say in the situation we have MF, it goes from here. But I insist that I need a billion category. And in general, does not we do not know whether it exists. Although in some cases we do even know everything we want to know about this. I'll I'll talk about this, but in general it's a conjectural object. Now, why, why I put this now, if you take some f, for example, q, then there's a picture by Langlands, and then make precise Clausel and other people, which basically says the following, that if you consider pure motives uh, over q, then they somehow sit in the set of Automorphic cuspidal mm, representations of GLN Q. Oh, sorry, GLN Adels of Q. They give a little part of this, but uh, since to the work of uh, Clausel and so on. So, so Clausel, we, we know how they should sit there, and we know a lot about this. But as I just mentioned, so they sit inside of mixed motives and so one can wonder so that's a kind of basic question uh, can we see mixed motives over Q over number field just mentioned Q for simplicity uh, in automorphic terms 
And more specific question about this is like that. So we can ask, for example, can we see periods uh, of this mixed motives over Q in aftermorphic terms, in aftermorphic world, so to speak. And uh, to this, uh, again, I'm not talking about periods which come from pure motives. So there, it's by definition there. They, by, they, we, we see them. This picture <laughs> tells us they should be there. But we, I'm talking about mixed periods. And the simple thing is this. So you can take some pure motive M, pure. Then it corresponds to some automorphic representation Vm. And both have L functions. And up to some normalization, they actually equal. That's how uh, correspondence manifests ourselves. But now we can take S to be special, B in some integer up to some normalization. And then in this case, the situation is quite good because, uh, quite good still conjecturally, because there are conjectures of Deligne and Balinson uh, which say, uh, in particular, one other thing that say, so it was the linear block, and finally, uh, the final form is Balinson, the general uh, uh, conjectures. They say that this L values, M or whatever, uh, they are related. Uh, to mixed periods. To, to be precise, again, I'm going to be very weak here. So if this m is something like i-dimensional cohomology of some x, uh, which has dimension n, then uh, I'm saying that if you take L value of hi of x uh, at the point n, and it's related to period of this motivic x1. And I assume here that the weight, which is i minus 2n, let's say, is less than 3. So uh, times some other things, which I'm also periods, but which I'm not even talking about. So we see from that that this x1 is bound to appear, x1 of uh, motive, which corresponds to autonomic representation, because we actually do have special values. And so we are going to see determinant, period of determinant of this. But uh, this uh, special values and this x1, it's a very, very tiny part of the, the whole category. And so the main uh, question is, so can we see much more than that? And so I claim that this correspondence, is they provide some glimpses of things which go beyond this thing, this x1. And so now I'm basically uh, starting the coherent discussion. So th this was my long motivation. All right. So the first, so I, uh, I'm going to proceed in the following way. So I'm going to discuss, describe Hodge realization first and what, um, what emotive correlators first and the Hodge correlator first. And only after then, probably next time, we have chance to, I'm going to describe the other part. Can you say about the words correlate? I'm going, OK, good. So uh, I still take excuse to talk in general terms for three more minutes. So what's the goal? So I want to build the following diagram. So first of all, I take motivic fundamental group of uh, uh, my curve. Then it's a mixed motive. So I take associate graded with respect to the weight filtration for that. So now it's a pure motive. Now, because it's pure motive, due to formalism, which I didn't explain yet, but will explain today, uh, it follows that there is some Lie algebra, which is called the motivic Galo group of the category of mixed motives, which maps here. That's a natural map. So it describes. Uh, this, this mixed motive by the de describes by, by a representation of some uh, uh, some motivically algebra. So it's, this is motivic Galois algebra. 
Now, this is parallel to the uh, known picture that if you take a logic realization of x v0, then uh, to automorphisms of this guy, there's a natural map from the Galo group of f bar over f. And so this is a motivic version of, of, of that. Uh, Oh, no, 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 of the okay. uh, uh, category M, M, F, and it's itself Lie algebra in the category of pure motors. It's not a Lie algebra over Q. Okay, now then what I want to construct, I want to construct some other Lie algebra. This is this Lie algebra of motivic correlators. And I want it to the constructed together with canonical map here. And uh, this is a construction which doesn't use too much assumptions. But then if I assume that mixed motives do exist, then it comes with canonical arrow here. And so I'm basically factorizing this action. So something which is very, very uh, kind of clear. This is this Lie algebra of motivic correlators. Now, to the question of Peter, who are these motivic correlators? So let me answer this just directly. So you can dualize this map. So there is some map here, phi. You can dualize this and consider map from Lie dual, the dual space to this Lie algebra. Uh, sorry, it goes the other way. So you consider this Lie. Uh, related to x, dual, and it goes then to dual uh, to this motivic Lie algebra. This is what I call the motivic correlator map. It's just a linear map. Now, what it is good for is that we can combine this with a Hodge realization if it does it. So now I will stop them talking uh, in very general terms in a second, but just want to answer Peter's question. So this is natural map provided by the Hoche realization. And it turns out there is a canonical map to real numbers here. So this is not conjectural. This is honest map. And so now we get an honest map here. And so this map is what I called Hodge correlators. And so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to introduce this Lie algebra first. And I'm going to construct this map second. And then I'm going to explain that this map uh, just encodes the mixed structure on the, <coughs> on the material fundamental group. So that's now why I call them correlators, because this is infinite dimensional Lie algebra. You get infinite connection of numbers. They all package it into a Feynman integral. So actually, there's just one thing which is responsible for that. For that, And when you see its uh, kind of traces, you, you see these maps. OK? All right. So then maybe I, I thought in what kind of order it organizes. Maybe why don't I just introduce this Lie algebra? Did you say where does Feynman interval come from? This I don't know. <laughs> What's the relation for Feynman? Is X any more? What, what, what? X what is X? X, there's X. There's X. X is a curve here. There's a curve. Right? Yes. But uh, the construction is much more general than that. It works not only for curves. It works for arbitrary varieties and arbitrary, local, I would say, con local systems on them. Even huh? If you have a product of two curves, then what does your integral do? Is then what? What does your integral do for a product of two curves? No, I cannot answer what Feynman integral does. It's so <laughs> for me, it does. It produces these numbers. I will give examples, yes, and they're related to rankin solberg integrals. But let me start talking about something which has. OK. To which? To right hand side? Yes. Ah, also a good question. I I'll never end the introduction. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what one needs to do. Uh, one consider M the universal modular curve. This is actually a great question. 
So one studies the, this picture for the universal modular curve. And then this uh, description of pi 1 Hodge of this modular curve makes sense. The question does not, but it makes sense, let's say, for uh, locally symmetric spaces uh, for GL2 over number field. GL2 only, but for number field can be made a variable. For example, for, hi for hyperbolic threefolds. So I'm saying the description makes sense, but the question doesn't make any sense. So I don't know what the question is, but I, I'm, I'm saying, uh, <laughs> seriously. So, but I'm saying that I give description of the hodge-realization of the fundamental group in a way, in a different way, in such a way that it has an analog for arbitrary symmetric space, where the question which it answers uh, is beyond my imagination. So <coughs> It's actually, it's, it's, I would be extremely glad to uh, discuss uh, what it could be and what it could not be. OK, let me actually so, start the lecture. So, so what Tivik uh, relator Lie algebra. What's that? This is just a Lie algebra. This is just a Lie linear algebra construction. So uh, let's do a warm up. So let's suppose that you have a V, a vector space. Uh, then you can assign to this a tensor algebra. And uh, you can assign to this a linear space. which I call cyclic tensor envelope of this vector space. Now, by definition, the cyclic tensor envelope of a vector space is uh, this. So I take tensors of all degrees that bigger or equal to 2 and divide them by the ones which are given by commutators. Now, why I call this cyclic tensor envelope? Because uh, there is an example of what's going on. Uh, so let's suppose that my vector space comes with a basis, E1 and so on, En. Then uh, this linear space cyclic tensor of V has a basis. And this basic is, is a basic in cyclic words. So the picture for this is the following one. So I make a circle, and I put on circle some elements of my basis. Now, why do they correspond to object like that? So I'm going just to consider an example. So what should I produce to this example if I put E1, E2, and E3? Then this picture means that I just take tensor product of E1, tensor E2, tensor E3, and divide it by equivalence, which I have that E1 tensor E2 tensor E3 is equivalent to E3 tensor E1 tensor E2. So I put here commutator, which means that I have a relation AB equals BA. This means that I can, roughly speaking, take this B and move it to the left. Now, if you play this game as follows, if you take this as your first tensor, then you multiply it by 3 to the right. This is the same as multiplied by 3 to the left. So this means it's a cyclic word, that it doesn't quite know where is right, where is left. OK? Sorry, I think, what does one tensor modular something mean? Uh, so I consider, <laughs> good. So I consider tensor algebra of the vector space. Look at this definition. And I consider here uh, elements which I consider modular li this linear subspace. Yeah. So in this tensor algebra, I have the following element, E1, tensor E2, tensor E3. You're explaining why. I explain that I project this element to the quotient. It doesn't, and that, you're explaining why it doesn't depend on the ordering. Yes. Of the exactly. Not uh, actually cyclic uh, shift. So the element is the, is just the coset. 
Exactly. And so this is just a notation for this coset in the vector space given by, by tensor algebra modular relations like that. So you're right, it didn't quite have perfect meaning, but that it means that you take this element, modular relations like that, in particular modular this relation. And so this means that now they're cyclic, they live cyclically in a circle. Okay? Now, after that, it's uh, easy to say, maybe I can still use this, who this uh, Lie algebra is as a vector space, as an object. It is, as I said, where is that? Uh, so you consider this vector space. So you take any element like a and b, and you say that uh, a and b minus b a equal to 0. You put this relation. So that includes b1 and e2 the uh, Yes. This means that, for example, I can talk about simple pictures like that. So it's, it's a cyclic tensor. All right. Now let's make a definition. So remember that I start with some curve x. So I have x, x in my background. This is the one. So what's the difference between this one and symmetric? What? Symmetric, sorry, sorry, what? What's the difference between what you write down there and between symmetric and Tensor algebra is an algebra. CT is a vector space. Hmm? <laughs> you mod out by linear combination of shape AB minus BA. I see. So it's a one linear space over the other. Get the linear space. OK? But we are going to see in a second that uh, in our game, it will be Lie algebra. But let's see, first of all, what the object is. So let's make an official definition for, for the C Lie X. This is, by definition, the CT. Uh, applied to the associate graded for the weight filtration of H1 uh, of my X. So I have my open curve X. Mm. So tensor algebra of that. Tensor with a tate twist by Q minus 1, which is just H2 of X. That's the meaning of that. Okay. So I think about this as a pure motive. And so how it looks as a pure motive, so I remind you that uh, we have mm, a description that this h1 of x maps to h1 of x bar. And it sits here, q of 1 raised to this set S minus distinguished element I had. And so this guy has weight minus 1. It's a pure motive weight minus 1. This guy has weight minus 2. So this guy is mixed. But if I consider GUR, H1 of x, this is just H1 of x bar plus this Q of 1 raised to the set I called S star, S minus S0. OK? So if you're scared about motives, you can think this is about, let's say, vector space or Galo model, or beta realization, or drum realization, or Galo realization. But I'll say this is just a pure motive. And it lives in the tensor category. So I can do all operations of tensor algebra with this. I can take tensor algebra of this pure motive. And I can, can go to cyclic tensor envelope of that. OK? Now, the next thing which is important about this very specific situation is that um, uh, I have a little better way uh, to explain this uh, CT construction. So it's a better way to think about this CT. <coughs> 
uh, oh, I called C Lee of x. So I start with the following. So what I have in my disposal, I have the constant sheaf on my curve. And I have the delta sheaves, skyscraper sheaves. It's a constructible sheaf uh, at the point we deleted. It's part of f. And now what I can do, I can take different x groups between them. Yes. Uh, I would rather say that this is a pure mod of Q, but you can treat it as a Q vector space for, for a long while. That's OK. So now what do we know about them? So we have some x groups between them. So we have x0 between uh, Q of x and delta s. And this is just Q. It's a pure trivial motif. Then we have from Poincaré duality the only non-trivial group the other direction. Uh, it's constant shift on x bar. So you right, I everything is on x bar. I'm sorry. And uh, uh, this is just uh, q of minus one. And also, I wanted to restrict my attention to the cohomology of the curve, which I think as just x to 1, first cohomology, between these two sheaves. So this is the three guys I want to play. And they come with non-degenerate pairing. Mm. So first of all, you can take x1, q of x bar, q of x bar, tensor of h uh, itself. And map it to uh, h2, which is q of minus 1. Is it still visible uh, for the people on the left, or this is beyond your visibility? Huh? It's not. Huh? OK, so I'm going to do something about this. <laughs> so what I'm writing is a absolutely key part of the linear algebra of this construction, and so I don't want it to be missed. So I have pairings, non-degenerate pairings. Uh, so I take x to 1 between, if you allow me to just, OK, I'll still write q of x bar. But I'll soon stop writing this in such detail. x1 q of x q of x. So this goes non-degenerate to h2 of x, which is the same thing as q of minus 1. And on the other hand, you can take, for example, x0 <coughs> from q to delta s tensor x2 from delta s to q and goes the same spot. And you can actually ex exchange them. There is a third one, and it is you exchange them, and you will put minus sign in the end. But let me just put this two so far on the blackboard. So there is this pairings. and. If you consider the following object, if you just take, let's call it E, it's x1 of q x q x plus x0 q delta s plus x2 delta s q, then this guy comes also with a pairing. So you have a map E tensor E to uh, q of 1 as well. And this map is also non-degenerate. Uh, so first of all, this is the usual uh, Poincaré pairing. 
So it comes with a sign. And this one, you will see what sign I will, I'll need. OK, so I have, in the end of the day, I have a big motive. So this is, for me, it's just a pure motive. And it comes with a, a non-degenerate pairing, which will be symplectic. OK, now this is now the main point of the game. So I want to draw you some pictures which explain how you think about the cyclically guy. Which will make obvious the fact that it's a Lie no, not obvious, but natural, the, the fact that it has a Lie algebra structure. Depending on the curly E or just the direct sum of the. What? Depending on the curly E is the direct sum of the. So you can get from this data non degenerate pairings. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Non degenerate symplectic pairings. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yes. Now, S, is one all of them? S all of them, okay. except S0. Because it models the situation of GR W. H1, and so it's all of them except one, as zero. Can you perhaps repeat what uh, all these things are sheaves on? I mean, so we have a regular uh, projective curve. It's called X bar. And they are sheaves on X bar. On, uh, after taking the algebraic closure? Or yes. It's, it's, a, it's a sheaf. It's a sheaf. It's a constant sheaf on the, on the curve. So in the end, uh, then later on, we are going to take x between these sheaves, and they are going to be our motives we're talking about. It's basically just saying they're just h1. Sorry, what? They, they may enter, but uh, I'm saying that uh, so far I consider this as a, as a pure motive, so I didn't even talk about Galois cohomology. There are sheaves for which topology. Hmm? There are sheaves for which topology. <laughs> so, good question. So, I'm I want to talk about motives. So, so, if I really want to talk about this, I want to talk about motivic sheaves. Okay. So, uh, then if you want. <laughs> Then, if you want to proceed to a discussion which uh, you want to accept, we say that let's go to some realization, let's say beta realization. And let's say IOF is a complex number. Then we just talk about usual sheaves in the classical topology. Or we can say we go to a Taller realization, then it will be Eladic sheaves. Or we can do something else. But. We. You over bar. Then you, you want the x also you want the x to sheaves on the Galo group. over the algebraic closure or over, uh, it will be Galo F bar F models. Okay. But uh, I really think it's simpler to think about these terms as motives because uh, it's another question how they are realized, but from the point from the motivic point of view, you are going you're talking about some linear algebra. You have some linear algebra data, you have some object of your semi-simple category, and the object, object comes with a symplectic pairing. That's it. So now the how this uh, data is transpired is trans transformed to realization, for example, a Lattic one. It's another question which we can discuss, but it makes it's a little more complicated to <coughs> Discuss. Okay, so uh, still, I insist that we talk about these motivic shifts. And so now we consider the following picture. So let's make a circle, a big one, and put on the circle uh, these objects. So the objects we have is this one. So here we have delta shift at point one. Here we have a uh, constant shift q. It's always over q bars, uh, over x, over x bars. So I'm going to maybe I write it once. Then we can again put here delta S2. We can put here Qx. We can put another Q, another Q. We may put here delta, maybe put another Q. So we can see the circle which is decorated by the objects I'm playing with, by delta functions of the constant sheaves. Now, uh, what I'm going to do with this circle, so I'm talking about uh, cohomology right now. So I'm going to put. Uh, homes. So here, okay. So I have some x here, some x here. This x are uh, completely canonical. This canonical x which lives in degree zero, 
And there is a canonical x which lives in degree 2. And then there is uh, one, again, completely canonical, which lives in degree 2. They go in packages, q to delta, delta to q. Uh, but then there is x which lives in degree 1. x which lives in degree 1. This is 0, 2, and so on. So I want to put between this arrow the x groups. OK? Now I'm. Yes, yes, yes. I, I'm, I'm about to write this. So to this guy, I assign uh, the group, but which one? So I take x1 between this qx and qx and shift it by 1. OK? Now, mm, just a second. So first of all, I wanted to correct myself. I disappeared. Let me say this again. So there are two guys, two, two things I can do. So I can take C Lee X and I can take dual of this. And this guy one is so this is the Lie algebra. So this is a cyclic tensor algebra of GUR W H1. And this is dual cyclic tensor algebra of actually H that's what's H Z homology of the cohomology. So I want to keep this on the blackboard so you're not and multi twisted by minus one. What? Do you want to add a dual on this one? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, so this is going to be Lie algebra. And this is going to be Cauli algebra. It's dual. Now, uh, since I want to play with the Lie algebras, I actually have to dualize everything. So I'm sorry for this complicated notation. So what I'm saying is that I always consider this object simple objects, but then I, I either take the x between them or dual to the x. But whatever I do, I always shift by 1. OK? So now this is, uh, now I gave you official definition how, you think how this circle produce you something which lives in C. So this circle produces you an element uh, which lives in this C, C Lee. X. Is that clear what the element which corresponds to this picture? No. OK, so once again, so you take, you take a circle and you put to the circle a bunch of simple objects you play with. They are either delta functions or constant shifts. And the rule of the game is that two delta shifts never talk to each other. They never uh, near, near each other. Uh, then anything else. So you can put constant shifts. Then you want to assign to this picture some element which lives here. Now, what is this by definition? So this is by definition some cyclic tensor algebra of the homology group. So I want to produce element of the cyclic tensor algebra of the homology group. And I'm doing this uh, in a little perverse way. I'm saying that I first consider cohomology group, shift by 1, and then I dualize. I get a homology group. Okay? So this, is, this guy lives here in particular. And if you take, for example, this guy. Uh, it belongs to, uh, OK, what, good, 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 good. It leaves, it, it means that this is, you can call it h1 of x bar. It's the same thing, right? Uh, shift it to the right by minus 1, OK? Uh -huh. So h1, uh, uh, sits in gr w of h1 of x. And I shift everything by minus 1. So don't forget this. This is homological shift, not that, that twist. OK? Is that all right now? No, I thought we were getting an element of there. Well, we we're getting element of the cyclic tensor product. But cyclic tensor product, uh, in order to define it, I first of all need to get element of the tensor product. OK? OK. So we haven't got an element. We've got not yet. we just a building block. So we're getting element. So I said we get a, one guy which lives in H1. OK? I didn't, I didn't say vector or something. I, I just get that, that we get object of my category, which you can loosely call a vector space. 
Uh, we get object in the category of pure motifs, or in better realization, it's just a vector space. This one. Okay. okay? All right? Now we want to take tensor product of them, so let's just make it. So remind you that we have a circle, but let's fix some uh, starting point on this circle. Then I have my objects, so I take, so what I'm doing, I take in my X groups between object one to object two. So I take one, then I shift by one, and then I dualize. Then I tensor this with a similar guy. Uh, let me not put any marks here. Between E2, E3, shift it to 1, and dualize. Then tensor X star between E3, E4, and dualize. And in the end of the day, we come back, so we get X star between E n and E 1 is by 1 and dualize. OK? So this is the vector space or tensor product of pure motifs and therefore a pure motive, which corresponds to this picture with uh, one point distinguished. Is that OK? Now I can just put projection to the cyclic envelope. And so I get this guy, and uh, twisted by minus one. Uh, yes, this is sub motive of. So this is sub motive. So it leaves which means it's sub motive of this cyclic tensor algebra of a w h one of x. Yes, tensor q of what? tensor q of minus one. Okay. Yes, 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 because w is slightly smaller. No, 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 no. It's uh, so why it's small? It's it's uh, it's it, it's lives in this cyclic tensor algebra of this script E. We seem to only have one. We've got for each point, little s. We seem to have a two-dimensional space here, whereas before we had a one-dimensional. No, for each point of s, we have a space and a dual to the space. We have you two. Didn't, you didn't have that. Yeah, I did, because I have x0 and x2. And I explicitly said here that there is a non-degenerate pairing between them. So in the way before we got h lower 1. What? The, the graded part, weight graded thing of h1 of x, it seems like you have one extra dimension. You're asking the following question. What it has to do uh, with what I'm talking about? So I am about to explain this. OK? So you ask, you, ask, you ask a very good question. You ask how this relates to, 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 to what I was doing before. And you're absolutely right that before, I didn't have this, I didn't have that. And I have just this uh, uh, element. No, that's this is, I think this is a problem. I didn't explain this yet. But this is not in, it's not related to growth WH1 uh, of X. It will be related in a second. So, so it's got extensions in the wrong way. No, no. OK. So it's going to be, in a second, you're going to see how this guy is, is mapped there, OK? In one second. So uh, what I said is that you have the cyclic tensor product. And now, uh, first of all, if I, if I remove uh, delta functions from considerations, you don't complain, right? Complain about what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying that. Yeah, then you can map it. If 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 I if I if I if I put S into the game, I have to explain how to map it, and I didn't yet explain this how. So this is last piece of this date, this construction. Now, maybe I do it a separate way. So, so if you have a circle and you have this data, you have delta function s, and you have two constant shifts here. So in the game I'm playing at the moment, I have uh, x group like this. I'm talking about, let's talk about homologies. I have 
homology, cohomology. So first I have X group here and second X group here. But both of them are completely canonical. So there is a canonical home here and canonical X here. So what I'm saying is that whenever I see this piece of my data, I'm going to assign this to the generator, maybe I call it XS, which belongs to GUR W H1 of X. So it's not that, that I assign something to this home or to this home. I assign to this tensor product an element which has, uh, as you can see, it has weight, it has a correct weight, it has weight minus two. So once again, so this guy is direct sum of Q of one raised to power S star plus H one of X. And here there is a basis, canonical basis, which I called uh, this element, I call them X sub S, all right? So they just loops around punchers, okay? So you're saying each, the, the two X groups involved both mm -hmm. the canonical basis. Mm -hmm. Give me one element. And the tensor product. Yes, yes. Therefore the canonical basis and you map it to the canonical basis. Yes, here. yes, yes. So now I can make legitimate statement well, this is here. Okay? Hmm? Let me just proceed with this definition. I said this is a better definition to think about this CT than just, just talking why and what I'm doing here. So I wanted to introduce the Lee bracket on uh, on this on this object, so I wanted to be able to take a Lie bracket of two guys like that. Okay, Richard, is there a question? I see from your. Yeah, I, I mean we still haven't got an element. We've got a subspace. Oh yes, definitely. We are not talking about elements. We 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 saying that this picture produces a uh, an uh, subobject in this silly. So it's it's a, it's a it's a tensor category. So we produce, each picture like that produce me an object which is of m possibly very high rank, very high dimension, which lives in, uh, lives in this CT. So if you, I'm not, I, I never talk about vectors there unless I go into uh, beta realization or something like that, okay? okay? If I decided to go, let's say, to Galois realization, I can take this huge Galois model and start picking vectors there, but I'm not, I'm not doing this. Otherwise, I would be taking home from Q to this object. But again, I, I'm not, I don't want to do this at the moment. I don't need to do this. This is just an object of this pure category. Yes, it will be. This is a linear isomorphism between CT. Yes, it, it is basically by definition, if you think about this. Uh, by definition and by this rule. Some of the images is, is, is the whole city, yes. So this, this, this picture, these circles give you, it's, uh, this city is breaked in a sub-objects and uh, there is a basis which is given by these pictures, okay? Not hmm? the basis, I mean, you're saying it's a direct sum of the images. Uh, I, uh, whenever you, you have, I have a semi-simple category and I have a big object in this category and this object is given to you as a direct sum of smaller sub-objects. And these smaller sub-objects, each of them corresponds to this circle. And I loosely talk about small sub-object as element of the basis. I certainly should not do this, but it's just. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. So, so once again, so this is a big, big object in this, uh, semi-simple category, you can think about this as a Lattic representation of your Galois group. And this huge infinite dimensional object is split naturally into direct sum of finite, uh, of, of sub-objects, which are of finite rank if you consider them in realization. Okay? Now I wanted to tell you uh, the, uh, the next thing. The next thing is how you uh, make a Lie bracket between these objects. Okay? And this is where this presentation is, I think, is in indispensable. <laughs> and on the level of the pictures, it's extremely simple. So let me just tell you, let me just draw pictures and then explain why these pictures do the job. Uh. 
Now, suppose I wanted to take one picture and take its uh, commutator Lie bracket with the other picture. So then you look at these pictures, and then you notice that somewhere you see two nearby objects. And let's say that these objects are just Q and Q. Then they come uh, with certain element of homology group which sits between them. But then you look at the circle, circle and then you notice that uh, you might have another power of constant shift sitting here. And they come with another arrow between them. This arrow is an object of this semi-simple category I'm talking about. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to sue them. And don't forget that I have here tensor q of minus 1 and tensor here of q of minus 1 on the top of these guys. Now I'm going to sue them, so glue them, whatever. And then I get a picture like that. So it comes with the two objects sitting here. And so what I'm doing, I'm taking this part of the picture and I glue this together. So when I glue this, so out of this, I, I no longer, longer get anything here. So I just glue these two guys, OK? But there's something I have to explain. So when I glue them, I have to say that there is this map. So in this case, it will be mapped just between h1 of x bar. I write this in a kind of uh, what it is without talking about this x. So there is a guy which goes to q of 1 here. And so I use this. This is intersection pairing. OK? So I can take, whenever I see what I'm saying the following, that whenever I see a pair of objects, nearby objects, I look for a similar pair of nearby objects such that I can glue them. And to glue them, the objects should match. So for example, I have q and q here and q and q here. But so this is just an example. But whenever I glue them, I suppose to kill the two homology group, which stands here. And I can do this using my in intersection pairing. So what is this intersection pairing? Remember that I started saying that I have this one. But because it's non-degenerate, I can dualize and get a map on the dual guys. So I use the fact that my pairing is non-degenerate. And so I use this, not the original. Uh, 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 OK? Is that clear what I did here? Is that clear or it's not clear? OK? You want to map a tensor product of 2 and group to another tensor product of 2 and group. No, what I have here, you, so you have here, uh, I, I said that this is picture, maybe didn't explain the, the details. So I have here this big cyclic words. Maybe I call this, so this one which goes from here to here, it's a big tensor product of x groups. I, I call, for example, A. OK? And then I have another big tensor product of the x groups. I call it, for example, B. So when I do a gluing, so I have this tensor product sitting here. This is my A. And I have this one sitting here, which is B. But I can sue them together because I'm living in the cyclic tensor product. So there is no product suing them together. OK? Just a second. So we need to understand first, and then we go to the second. Huh? Because I have this, uh, so I, I, I matched the, 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 the red guys, the, 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 the blue ones, but I have the pink or the red guys. They're not part of this picture on the right. They're gone. How they're gone, they have to be intersection paired. OK? No, it's not a scalar. That's, that's also the point. It's not a scalar because it pairs to q of 1. 
But remember, that's another detail about this construction. I always tensor these circles with Q of minus 1 here. Yes. And one of them is getting eaten with this one. And so this gum comes with tensor Q of 1, Q of minus 1 again. OK? Mm? I don't remove points at all. So the points, if you mean vertices, these guys, I don't remove them. I remove just the intervals between them. No, you, you, have, you have Q of minus 1 here, and you have Q of minus 1 here. But the intersection pairing goes to Q of plus 1. So now I pair this and that, and I get just Q. I can do that. So I cross them out. So I left with one of them, this one. OK? So I got at, I got at least some uh, bilinear ma some, some map between the spaces. Now, there are two things about this. First of all, if you think about this map, it's actually skew symmetric on the nose. Because if you try to put b on the left, and first of all, how, how you do it. So as Peter said, I just did half of the job because I didn't explain what, I, what do I do if I have some delta function sitting somewhere. I'll explain in a second. But if I didn't have any delta functions, I still have a common because I can take this picture, I call this picture A, and this B, and then produce A bracket B. But I claim this is the same as minus B bracket A. So A, this operation, gluing operation B, is naturally minus B gluing operation A. So why this is so? Because uh, at first it, it looks that you don't have minus. What you do, you say that, all right, now you. I just want to draw a picture. So what if you take B and then do this operation with A? So what we get in the end, we get B and A. So we get B going first and then A going second. So we get like B going first and A going second. And if you do this A, B, you get A traveling first and B going second. But in the cyclic world, they're the same. They're exactly the same thing. It's just you're taking, you're traveling A, B all the time here. And they, this picture and this picture are just identical. OK? OK? But where is the minus sign? The minus sum comes from the fact that I have to take this intersection pairing. I have to pair left arrow with the right arrow on the first picture, and right arrow with the left arrow on the second picture. It's Q-symmetric, so you get the minus sign. So it's actually minus that. So I already defined, therefore, a part of this Lie bracket, which does not involve delta. OK? Yes, yes, definitely. So it's like you have two guys, and one is looking into the other and, and looking for, for for a pair, and as soon as it's C pair, it's kind of pairs with this pair. But now, what to do? What? No. And pairs of I is only Q of X and Q. Hmm? The pairs means only two Q of X and two Q of X. Yes, two, two simple objects. Uh, but also a delta. Uh, that's about, I'm about to say this. Now, how to do with the deltas? So, with the deltas, it's actually sort of the same. Let's suppose you have. OK, I have to draw a bigger picture. Delta S here, then it necessarily comes with Q here and Q here. And let's suppose that you found in the other picture something like that. Delta S, Q, and Q. Mm? Same S, same S, same S. So you look at the pair. So for example, this matches this, this matches this. So I can try to pair. So I have arrow in this direction and arrow in this direction. I can try to match them up here. And I can definitely do this because I have home from delta to Q tensored by home from Q to delta. They exactly the way uh, my pairing works. And they produce me a Tate motif in the end. OK? Or I can do another thing here. I can just take uh, home from here to here. And then I have to pair it with home to here to here because the arrow are glueable only this way. So I can glue them this way. 
And so I claim that if you put all this together, so this is my Lie algebra. The filling. Hmm? Oh, when you pair them, so for example, this picture, you have uh, x from delta to q. Let me put it in this picture. It's more suggestive. x to q to delta tensor x to delta q. It goes to x 2 from q to q. OK? I, I, Where is built? Uh, let's say again. So, so this intersection pairing. So here, I'm saying that I have this x uh, zero q delta tensor x two delta q again map to q of one, the same q of one. Because in this case, it's x zero and x two, and as a motive, this is q and this is I said q of one. I mean, I'm considering here homology group. It's it's dual to x. OK? So, so, so these two things that you can pair, you, you, you add them? Mm, sorry? These two, I mean, you can either do the bottom two or the top two. You, you do both. I do either both. I do both uh, uh, once in a time. I do either this top two or the bottom two. Oh, either? I mean, at every time, I do one. And I take sum over all possibilities. So in the end, you will have both? Yes. So just in simple words, the rule is the following. So you have your circle, which is occupied by a collection of simple objects. Any pair of the simple objects are related by some object, by x between them. And then the gluing works as follows. You take these two circles occupied by simple objects, and then look for whatever appearance of two neighbors in one circle and two neighbors on the other circle, which are gluable. Gluable means that they are isomorphic when you identify them. And also, by construction, the dual to x groups between them is canceled by the intersection pairing, producing uh, this useful <laughs> contribution to q of 1, which is a very essential part of the game. OK? OK, so I built a Lie algebra. Absolutely, absolutely. This construction is much more general than the way I presented it. I can take any uh, semi-simple category, for example, where the x groups between, between this category or some part of the x groups, if you take the direct sum, they have uh, what's called these days uh, Calabi-Yau structure, just uh, the intersection pairing. Intersection pairing to some uh, line, to some invertible one-dimensional object which sits in some fixed degree. In this case, this degree originally was 2. And so this construction goes literally without any change uh, to this situation. So for example, so I'm about to finish the first lecture. So for example, and this is very important for applications, you can take your curve, but instead of, let's say, modular curve, you can start taking some local systems on your curves. And it works the same way. So for example, you can take symmetric powers of uh, standard two-dimensional local system on the modular curve. So the structure is always there because you live on the curve. And so you can just literally repeat this construction in that situation. Then you're talking about something related to uh, curve and local systems. Or you can take arbitrary variety and play the same goal, uh, role with local systems, let's say delta shifts. Then you get something which is related to this bigger semi-simple category. Yeah. Hmm? Yes. <laughs> yes. Huh? Yes. I mean, it's true. You will see why it's true in a second. I mean, not in a second. Oh, no, no, no. I, I will prove it. But, but I will prove it not by checking it, but just by a little different construction. So I think that, uh, actually saying that I probably supposed to stop for like 20 minutes. So I'll, uh, so what I'm going to do after this, if you're, uh, come back. So I'm going to explain. <laughs> 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 Let me just say a few words where, where, where it goes. So I'm going to explain that uh, this Lie algebra, so I'm going to construct a very natural map of this C Lie x will map to derivations of this GUR WH1 of x. 
And so this map will be constructed by the same kind of construction. And from the very fact that I defined this map, you will see clearly that it really should, th the very fact that this is going to be a map which computes with the brackets, basically should convince you that the Lie algebra, that the Jacobi identity holds here because it holds here by definition. It's Lie algebra of derivations. So that's my next point. I'm going to construct this map. And then uh, the claim which I'm going to make is that what, whatever version of the Galois group you have, it's motivically algebra or elliptic realization Galois of bar over f, the natural map which comes this way, it's factorized through arrow here and natural arrow here. So this is, so to speak, the, the, the guy which describes the, the Galois action here. For the reason I will explain, it's a simple reason behind this. And so after that, I am going to say that, oh, and, and the last thing is that this map in some sense is an isomorphism. There is some subspace of derivations, special derivations, which are definitely in the image of the, the Galois goes to them. And then this is just an isomorphism. So it's just a description of all uh, kind of certain constraints on the image of the Galois group. And then I'm basically talking about this linear algebra data. So this is this motivic correlators. They are obtained by dualizing uh, this arrow. But these motivic correlators are objects sitting here. And so it's looking at these objects, I can see like this story and so on as well. And so I see it just by saying, so look, let's take a circle with a couple of roots of unity or torsion points. And by this game, it produces an element in the mixed mix motif. And let's look what kind of mixed motif and how it lives in the motivic clique algebra. So that's how the game is played. But th the key part is that there is this, this guy and this by derivations here. OK. So, so maybe we take a break till 3 o'clock. Okay. Uh, why it should be, why Jacobi identity should be uh, uh, correct. But maybe I say uh, a little bit about the fundamental group before, about the usual topological fundamental group, so you see where the story goes. So it'll take me maybe at about 10 minutes to talk about this. So just remind you. <coughs> that if you have a complex, I mean the Riemann surface, with some tangential vector and this point, so this, uh, so you have the usual fundamental group of, let's call it maybe Y. It's a, oh, may, maybe not. So just let's say X of C is zero. So this is a usual uh, uh, group and it's a free group. Uh, generated by loops around this point S in a star. A star is S minus S0. And uh, I put this in quotes H1 of X bar, which is just, uh, you can just pick some generators, P1 and so on, Pg, G is a genus in Q1 and so on, Qg. So this is a free group with this generator, so I call them X1 and so on, call them just Xs and this P's. So we have just some base points, so we have loops around the punctures, and we have loops uh, on this surface. Now, <coughs> if you want to define something uh, which has uh, more geometric nature, then uh, you define some Hoff algebra. Let's call it A. What? There is some points so as usual, so we have a curve with a uh, bunch of missing points. And one of them is a specific one, this one, S0. And then we're making uh, passes to punctures and loops around the curve. So it's a standard topological picture. So why I'm saying this is that we can make the following definition. We can say that beta version of the not fundamental group, but first of all, the related universal Verlpin uh, algebra is defined as follows. So it takes the group algebra of your pi 1. And you mod out this by the nth powers of the augmentation ideal. So i is a kernel of the natural map augmentation to q. And you take projective limit. And so what you get, it's a complete Hopf algebra 
over Q. And why it's a Hopf algebra? So uh, if you take element in your pi 1, G, then it goes to G tensor G. And so there exists unique coproduct with this property. OK. <coughs> so now, if you want to define what we are looking for, uh, pi 1 made nilpotent of my space x with base point with 0, then this is just, by definition, the set of primitive elements in this A Betty, uh, such as the coproduct of x is x tensor 1 plus 1 tensor x. Okay? And so this is naturally a pro-Lie algebra over Q. So this is the official definition of this uh, pro important completion of the fundamental group. And now I just need uh, to have a little structural statements about these guys. So if I take Gruer with respect to this iodic filtration of this A Betty guy, then it's by definition direct sum of i n over i n plus 1. And so this is isomorphic tensor algebra of the homology of i'm just a second. Yeah. Uh, I'm saying this is a Lie algebra. So, so if you have a Lie algebra, you can take universal enveloping uh, of this Lie algebra. And so Lie algebra sits inside, and the, its bracket on Lie algebra is inherited from the usual commutator bracket in the universal enveloping algebra. So here we produce universal algebra, universal enveloping algebra first, and then they define Lie algebra as a subspace inside. So the logic is that we take this Hopf algebra, which is a uh, projective limit of quotients of the group algebra of pi 1 by the nth powers of augmentation ideal. They like claim that there is a coproduct in this. Uh, on this. So first of all, it's an algebra. So there is a coproduct on this algebra, which has the property, and defined uniquely by that, that elements of the group goes to G tensor G. They are group elements. And then you take a certain subspace inside. So you take subspace of primitive elements. So element is called, huh? Huh? Oh, so but because I. Huh? Yes, primitive elements means elements defined by that equation. Yes, 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 yes. It's a general definition. If you have a Hopf algebra, you have the subspace of primitive elements. And then they form a Lie subalgebra in, their, in, this, uh, in the Lie algebra given by this associative algebra, where the commutator so commutator the there is. Betty preserves this pi 1 mil, these primitive elements. Yes, yes, yes. And it's you take that yes, yes. I take commutator uh, in this Hopf algebra, just AB minus BA. And it preserves the subspace of primitive elements. It's a general property of a Hopf algebra uh, and set of primitive elements there. OK? So uh, why I needed to say all this, uh, that first of all, I'm not going to explain why uh, it's immediately clear that this construction of geometric origin. I can do this later. But I still need to mention something about this. So. <coughs> So if you just consider this guy is isomorphic somehow to tensor algebra of the first dimensional homology group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, I, what I'm going to skip, at least uh, right now, there is an explanation why uh, this uh, vector space is realized by cohomology of uh, algebraic variety, which is uh, it, it's, 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 one can do it quickly, and I will do this later. I just don't want to go right now to this discussion, because I want to talk more about this Lie algebra. But uh, if we know that, then, you can, then it comes with a weight filtration. And so uh, mm, this pi 1 nil of x is 0 has a natural a weight filtration. And so if you take the associate graded uh, for mm, this guy has and also a beta. They both have 
natural weight filtrations. Actually, A bait is just universal enveloping of uh, pi 1 nil. So one determines the other. So if I take uh, gur w of this A, let's say beta, or you can put motivic here, uh, I'm now jumping. I'm saying that this is object actual geometric origin, which I did not explain, and I will explain on demand, So, but not, not right now. So uh, <coughs> this is actually uh, canonically tensor algebra of the associate graded of the one dimensional of homology curve. Uh, so tensor algebra of GUR with respect to the weight filtration of one dimensional homology of the, uh, of the curve. And this is why this object appeared before, because of this uh, canonical isomorphism. Now here, there is a subspace, which is this pi 1m. You can put nil instead of m. And so you can take GUR w. And this is uh, freely generated by the same uh, guy, GUR w h1 of x. So uh, again, topologically, uh, this is at least a clear that they have the same size, because uh, topologically, this tells our algebra, and this tells our algebra looks the same. But if you put weight filtration into the game and take the associated gra graded quotient with respect to the weight filtration, then the isomorphism becomes uh, really canonical. And uh, <coughs> that's why we're talking about this. Now comes a very uh, important fact. Mm. Where is this fact in my hands? Mm. So we can look at the lattic picture. And so we are going to see something in the lattic picture. So first of all, how the lattic picture develops. So your group is replaced by its pro-L completion. Uh, now, this comes with the lower central series, pi 1, LK, low central series. And so you can consider the corresponding quotients, pi 1, L, divided by the lower quotient for the case quotient for lower central series. And this is actually a Lady Lie group. And as such, so I can take the Lie algebra of this guy, and then I take a limit of this over k. And so I get some elliptic Lie algebra, which we can call Lie pi 1 L. So this is elliptic incarnation of the motivic guy I was talking about. Now, why this is important? For the following reason. Which is absolutely key to uh, what I'm going to say. Uh, first of all, as everybody knows, there's color f bar over f. Now my curve was over field f. So it acts, maps to. Uh, aftermorphism group of this pi 1, and therefore it acts to the aftermorphism group of the Lie algebra of this pi 1 L. But now there is a construction of the Lie, which is this tangential base point construction. Uh, and so it says the following, that there exists canonical map uh, of Galois models. So if you take Galois model ZL of 1, then the map is related to tangential base point. 
the tangential base point allows you to map the L of 1 to pi 1 of L, uh, which is, let me write this way, this is the same thing as pi 1 of L ts 0 x bar minus 0 v 0, and it maps to pi 1 L of x. Uh, sorry, I think the people from the right and do not see what I'm writing, so let me just rewrite it here. So there's a map from zl of 1 to pi 1 L of x v 0. Uh, so this is a crucial thing. So it says that whenever you have uh, this curve I'm talking about, and you consider the situation elliptically, then you see that there is a kind of canonical loop around this uh, point S0 where I am considering my tangential base point. So it's absolutely canonical loop. And so if you restrict the action of your Galois group to, let's say, Galois of f bar by f with uh, zeta l infinity uh, adjoint, or joint roots of unity, then it will just preserve this. Uh, Point. So, so this slightly smaller Galois group just preserves this element. Now, we are going to play uh, with this observation. And so we say that this is true elliptically, and therefore it's going to be true motivically. So I'm going to transfer from elliptic situation to motivic situation and say that motivically we're going to see the same. Now, why I'm not explaining, I didn't explain what this tangential point is. So there's an author, so I'm not going uh, to do this. But uh, I'm going to use it. And I'm going to explain what exactly I'm going to use it. So uh, uh, sorry, what? There is a weight filtration there as well. Uh, I did not explain where does it come from. I did not explain what is the geometric realization of uh, pronipotent completion of the fundamental group of a curve. Or, al uh, or algebraic variety. So I can do this a little later, but uh, I just decided not to do this at this particular moment. OK? So uh, just a second. Mm. Well, let me just put together my nose. OK, so now we come to the following situation. So look. Look at these isomorphisms. So what I'm saying is that uh, there is a distinguished element in this GUR WH1, which is going to be preserved by whatever action of whatever Galois group. And so this puts a restraint uh, on the representation of the Galois group. But there's more to say about this, because if you took this another point S, then what you do, you do a pass here. And uh, here, there's also this canonical uh, loop, but uh, uh, based at this point. And so this pass is not going to be preserved by the conjugacy classes of loops around Si are preserved. OK? So that, that's the key point. So because of the existing tangential base point at any tangential point, not the loops themselves, but the conjugacy class are preserved. Because the Galois group, it maybe moves this path to somewhere else, but the conjugacy class preserves. Therefore, we come to the following definition. So let's say that a derivation. of uh, this GUR W uh, by 1 of m x v0, which, as I just explained, is the same thing as a free Lie of GUR W of h1 of x, mm, is special uh, if the following things are satisfied. 
So first of all, this derivation, let's call this derivation d. This derivation d kills this canonical generator at zero. So I remind you that this guy has generators, so I call them xs. Then there's generators pi and qi. And so uh, who is s0? So you can say that officially x0 is just uh, sum of these generators xs plus sum of the commutators. Again, the moral, uh, the role of this generator, as I explained, so this is just a canonical loop around the punctured point. But the point is that when I described the homology of my curve, this was the only point which didn't play any role in description, because I was saying that the homology corresponds to loops around all other points. And this one I missed. So now I'm saying, OK, that this one is, of course, recovered by, from the equations that sum of all of them equal to 0. But this one is a very special because it has to be preserved by the Galois action or whatever uh, variant of the Galois action. Okay, so this dictates this definition. And the second thing which it dictates is the following one: that if you take derivation of this Xs, where S is in a star, this is going to be commutator with some other element. So this just means that the conjugacy class is preserved. Not the element is preserved, but this conjugacy class is preserved. That there exists a FS which uh, this uh, rules. And so I consider the Lie algebra of all derivations like that. And now I can state the theorem. Uh, uh, maybe I can do it here. So the same way I can define, so I defined uh, special derivation of this guy, but I can also define special derivation of uh, A bit of A motivic, because it's just universal enveloping algebra. Hmm? No, no, no. D is a D is a uh, D is a automorphism of the freely algebra. G no, I don't. I don't put any conditions. So I I consider so the the only conditions which uh, topology tells me. So it tells me that I have to have this condition. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see any other conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you restrict to H1 X bar, then it's symplectic. But so far, so OK. So now let me, let, let me make a statement. So before I make a statement, mm, I have to uh, introduce you mm, the guys. So first of all, mm, let me make some notations, which are slightly more general than the ones I was talking about uh, before. So. Mm, Uh, I, I stop here because the notations which I made is slightly clashes with the one which I made for my like for my notes. Mm. Okay, so let me just say that C Lee tilde X dual is by definition the cyclic tensor algebra <laughs> of GUR. W of H1 of X uh, divided by a certain subspace. This is a little kind of little linear algebra nuisance that I have to go through, through all this. So uh, this is the key guy, but it turns out that, that the actual guy is a little smaller. So who are the shuffle relations? I'll tell you very quickly that if you consider cyclic works like this, 
like y0 tensor y sigma of 1 tensor on tensor y sigma of n. I take a sum over this, over all sigmas which are shuffles of type pq, where p plus q is n. Then th this is a subspace. The all elements which you get like this is called the shuffle relations. So I strongly advise you somehow ignore this. So I'm saying that I need to go to certain quotients and certain Lie algebra. You really uh, kind of ignore this because uh, in order to make a correct statement, I have to say this, but it's not that terribly important. Uh, <laughs> okay, so you have number n. You decompose this as n equals p plus q. And then you consider all sigmas in Sn, which works as follows. So you have ordered set 1, 2, and so on, p, and so on, p plus q. And then you shuffle it somehow. So you get i1 and so on, <coughs> i, p plus q. And the rule of the game is that the sigma uh, preserves the order of the subset from 1 to p and subset from p plus 1 to p plus q. The order of here and order of here preserved. But other than that, you can shuffle them in any way. Again, I kind of advise you not to pay too much attention to this. So this is a definition. This is a definition, yes. Then I define the dual object. Then I say that the silly, maybe this tilde, just a dual to uh, <coughs> the silly of x. But then it leaves in cyclic tensor algebra of gr w of h1. So I ended up by introducing some Lisa algebra. Remember, uh, here is cohomology, absolutely. So I end up with certain subalgebra which lives in my CT, and I put tilde saying that this is a little subalgebra. Now, now I, after that, I can make a statement which is correct. Mm. It's a theorem that there exists canonical isomorphism of Lie algebras. So this C, Lie, the subspace I'm talking about, maps and canonically isomorphic to all special deriv derivations of. Uh, Mm. Uh, you can put it gr w by 1m of x v0. Or what is the same, this is just freely <coughs> generated by the same subspace. Uh, by uh, of gr w h1. So this theorem explains uh, two things. So first of all, it explains that this uh, subalgebra of the guy I was talking about x somewhere. It takes by derivations of this group w pi 1. And certainly, it explains why it plays so central role, because this is the space of all derivations which obey the rules that they uh, uh, preserve the tangential base points. Now. Uh, this guy sits in C Lee, which was the main guy I'm talking about all the time. And this guy maps isomorphically to similar kind of derivations of gr w of a beta of xv, of universal enveloping algebra. OK? Now I'm going to explain how it acts. So I'm going to explain the bottom line, how this C Lee x acts by special derivations of this tensor algebra uh, of uh, first dimensional homology. So this is a fun part. So, so first of all, what is tensor algebra? of gr w of h1 of x. So how we think about this? So we think about this again in the same kind of picture way. So we have lots of objects. 
Now they put it, we put them on a line. And so this is maybe something like Qx, something like maybe like Qx, delta s, Qx, delta s1, s2, Qx, Qx. So we put a bunch of objects. And then we take the tensor algebra of the homology. So we put some homes between them. OK? So this is, this is how uh, sub-objects of tensor algebra of GUR H1 work. So I wanted to say that before that, I was kind of apologizing to, for putting too many linear algebra detail. Now you really should pay attention, because what comes now is a construction. So, uh, so this is tensor algebra, OK? So for example, here, what stands, I take this x1, qx, qx. Uh, twisted by 1 and dualize this. And this is the same as just h1 of x bar shifted by minus 1. OK? And the other uh, arrows I process exactly as here. Now, how are we going to? Yeah? Yes, yes, this is exactly this is, uh, this is the same trick which I used to answer Richard's question. So what we're going to see, we're going to see blocks. So this is our picture for XS. This is XS1. This is our picture for XS2. This is our picture for H1 uh, of X bar twisted, shifted by 1, but OK. So this is, again, uh, h1 of x bar. OK? That's why I said, what is tensor algebra? Everybody knows what tensor algebra is, but I prefer to think about this as li this little strange way. OK? Now, after that, the construction is obvious. So if you allow me, I, I wanted to, to erase this. So as soon as you allow me to do this, is that OK? No objections? Now, how it acts. So, so what you need to do, you need to take a circle like that and produce a derivation of guy like that. What does it mean, a derivation? This means that you apply it every way you see it. And so you take a word. And then this word somehow flows around this linear word. And then whenever you see a pair of objects, I put them E1, E2, just any pair of objects, an arrow between them. So uh, you find the matching pair here, for example, this one. Matching means they go in the opposite direction. So you put it like that. have some, some word A here. And then you just pair them up as before. So that's the way how, the, how this Lie algebra acts on the tensor algebra. That's it. Now, again, uh, you need to think a little bit about this. So it's completely clear what happens uh, when you have x from q to q. But then I also apply the same rule to this bits of xs. And I produce some kind of action on, uh, on tensor algebra. And now I claim that this action is, has exactly the property which I wanted. Actually, the property is that it, uh, uh, it is a special derivation. OK? But I, the construction, I hope, is clear. Or I have to say something formally about this. Do the diameters of the circle have any, have any <coughs> Circle doesn't have any diameter. It's, it's uh, it has it has it's a polygon. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's any polygon. So you take a big polygon of the x groups, and then you pair this polygon with this linear world, and you produce it another linear world. So now it goes like that. You take the same sequence, then you go around and go uh, go again. And this is exactly a derivation because you, you apply it everywhere. So it's by definition derivation. Now I want to write you some formulas for this derivation, from which you see that it is the derivation we are looking for. 
Yes? And this thing is a derivation. Huh? This thing is a derivation. Yes. Uh, by definition. So what is the der it's derivation, first of all, of whom? <coughs> derivation of whom? So, so this is derivation of the tensor algebra. Yes. Now, what does it mean? Uh, what do we need to do in order to produce derivation of the free algebra? So how derivation of the free algebra works? We apply this derivation to each of the, we write the word of tensor algebra as product of the generators, and then apply derivation to each of them and take a sum. Right? Yes. That's exactly how this construction works. You apply it uh, to each uh, pieces of the tensor product, and then you take the sum. Hmm? So y y you have probably the following question. So I, so I treat this combination of arrows as a single element of my GUR H1. And so when you apply, you apply you here and here. That's how you act on this. Direct sum of subspaces with a base. Oh, here it's a little uh, difficult. So, so we need to talk then in the appropriate language. So we have pure tensor category. We have tensor algebra in this pure tensor category. And then we have a notion of a derivation of a free object in this uh, associative algebra in this tensor category. And I claim that's exactly what this uh, construction does. Mm. So, and, I huh? I think I see why it's a derivation. Yeah, so for example, if you think about this as Galois model, then you probably don't have questions why it's a derivation, okay? I'm then, okay. What? Yeah, you, you act by the cyclic work to each home. Yeah, okay. Now, I actually want to write down formulas for this. Question, yes? There's this, this question of uh, Q delta Q. So what do you do at the end? You require that you have only Q with the Ah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, this is right. So this, this by definition, this, this guys appear only in this combination. Because what I'm really taking, I'm taking words like X, S, P1, Q2, X, X1, X, S2, uh, Q3, P1, X, S10, and so on. So this is the word I consider in, 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 co in basis. But now when you process this x, this x s means, means just the sequence. So it starts with q, ends with q. OK, now why special derivation? So there are formulas for that. So now this map, let's call this map uh, this a canonical derivation. In coordinates. Now, let's suppose that you start with cyclic tensor envelope of uh, arbitrary finite dimensional vector space with a certain basis. So, so you start with this guy. Now I define the notion of partial derivative, which acts from here to tensor algebra of y1 and so on yn. So this is a construction which first was used by Drinfeld uh, in about 88 in his papers on uh, Gala groups. And so, but I, it's probably very classical construction. That's why I learned it. So you just define this by, by, by example. You say the D over D of Y1 <coughs> of the circle, uh, now it's somehow clash with my notation, so I write it maybe this way. So I write like y1 tensor, y2 tensor, y1 tensor, y3, and you seek here. This is by definition as follows. So this d over y1, it cross out whatever appearance of y1 you have here. And so this is y2, y1, y3 plus y3, y1, y2. OK? Once again, so you take, a, you take any cyclic word of this y's, and then d over y1 just kills them one by one and takes the sum of what you get. Okay? This is mapped from cyclic tensor algebra to tensor algebra. Now, <laughs> given. What? Sorry, once again, I didn't hear. On the left, it's cyclic, on the right, it's not. Yes, yes, yes. So, so I read the word, find y1, cut it, and read it to the right. 
not to the left. <laughs> hmm? Yes. Why is it not defined on CT? Uh, because it's by definition cyclic. So let's do one more example. Hmm? Okay, look at this. So you have y1, y2, y1, y3, okay? Yes. Now, first of all, you kill this guy. Yeah, yeah I know what, but, but, I could, but that word is the same as moving the y1. Okay, well, let's write it this way. y1 tensor y3 tensor y1 tensor y2, okay? Okay? Cyclic. Richard, let me give... Yes, yes. You can you can always you can say this way. You can always put your favorite y one to the left in the cyclic world. But I could also put it to the right. You can put it to the right, but you have to <laughs> choose. <laughs> so this word that you've written, the first word you've written is equivalent to y two, y one, y three, y one. Exactly. Yes. And now if I apply that rule to that other thing, I will get precisely what I said because. I yes, no, I will. No, no. Richard, let's look at this example. <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly, huh? This I think somebody may have answered my question. You always, when you apply this rule, you always have to have a y1 on the left. Uh, this is one way to think about this. Or better, you s think about this as follows. So look, you take the cyclic world, then you kill this one. When you kill it, you cut it here, so it's no longer cyclic. OK? Now it has beginning and has the end, so it's its usual world, and it's this one, okay? Now, when you process the other appearances, y1, you cut it here, and so it's again all cyclic, so you read it this way, okay? So that's the notion of partial derivative. So now, uh, I say claim <coughs> that mm, an element F which belongs to the cyclic tensor product of, uh, I want to write group W H1, but uh, now we know that it has a basis, so I'm doing the basis version of this. Uh, so I take a kilinear span of this. So I want to describe how this cyclic polynomial acts by a derivation, okay? You follow me, that I, instead of talking about this GUR WH1, I wrote what it is in beta realization in terms of the generators, okay? So now I say that the rule is this. Uh, So the corresponding special derivation kappa f takes pi to minus df over dqi, qi to plus df over dpi, and xs goes to commutator of xs df over dxs. So this is a calculation in coordinates, the action which I introduced this way here, okay? Now let me explain why. So the statement is clear, right? So derivation is determined on generators and the text on generators as follows. I'm sorry, the statement is not clear for me. Okay. Yes, so, 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 so I take, so the claim was that the elements that the cyclic worlds defines your special derivations. Okay. So I take a cyclic world, but now I process a cyclic world in a, let's say, beta realization. So now instead of writing GUR uh, H1 
I write in just a vector space with a linear basis. It's a symplectic basis PQ plus basis of excess. excesses. Now I have to tell you how this cyclic polynomial defines you a, a derivation. And so it divides the derivation by these rules in which you recognize it's somehow a mixture of a Hamiltonian flow and Poisson flow. I don't know. It's neither this nor that. Uh, but uh, that, that's the way it acts. So if you forget about this, this is a standard uh, non-commutative Hamiltonian flow. Non-commutative, but still Hamiltonian flow. Now, why this is this so? so? You're saying this is the same action we had before. Yes, it's the same action, but written in coordinates. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, I just want to spend a minute and explain why this is the same action. So for example, so what would happen if you just have here Q and Q? And so you have, I mean, you have here Qx and you have here Qx, and then you have some kind of home. So how the story works? So you're supposed to take a cyclic word, the cyclic polygon, and then whenever you find here Q and Q, you're supposed to take this guy and pair it with this guy and kind of cancel them. Then you end up with the arrow, with the what you get, you get this, this, this element of the tensor product, OK? But this is exactly what this df over dp, df over d, dq does. Because this element, I'm now talking in coordinates, it's either p or q. And so you just take this guy, take over d over dfq, and pair it with p. Or I mean, p goes to df over dq, q goes to df over dp, because p and q are paired in this construction. So that explains this formula. The second one is a little bit more fun. So we have here Q delta S and Q. And again, you take your polygon. But now you have to take delta here. Now it comes with two arrows going from Q and Q here. And now you have to take either pair this with that, or you pair this with that. You have two options. So if you take this one, this and this one, then you will still have the following cyclic word. It will go like that this, and then you can still have to follow the remains here. Or you can do it the other way, but you'll get it with the opposite sign. And this is exactly the way how you get this commutator here. OK? OK. All right, so that's it about uh, this story. Now uh, I come to the main point of the discussion. So, so, so I hope not. So this story is talking about this Lie algebra, the story is, is, is finished. So now I wanted to produce uh, one thing. I want to produce a linear map. So yes. So why does this imply that it's a special? Oh, yes, yes. I, because I, uh, yes, thank you. I, because I forgot to explain this. It's uh, a few more minutes to explain this. So why does this explain this a special derivation? Let me explain. So first of all, let's just imagine that you don't have p's and q's. Just do an example when there are no p and q's. OK? Then uh, in this situation, the claim is that if you take any f from here, then the corresponding kappa f takes y1 plus and so on plus yn to 0. Because by definition, y0 is just minus y1 minus and so on minus yn. All right? Yeah. Now, the, the combinatorial question is why it takes, why this is true. So OK, imagine that you have this polygon built from y's. Like you have here y1, y2, y3, and so on. So this polygon is your f. Now you're going to act by this polygon on y1, y2, y3, and so on, and then see what happens. But whenever you take it, for example, uh, so you, you, you need to prove the following identity, that sum of yi df over d yi equal to 0. Right? And this is clear for the following reason. So what happens if you take, for example, if this is, for example, yi? So what are you going to do when you're doing this commutator? So first of all, you want to do df over dyi, right? This amounts to uh, somehow erasing this, OK? But then you're going to add the commutator here, which means that you either add it here like that, or in another term, you add it from here like that. Okay? 
there are two terms. Now, if you go around the circle, they cancel each other because this comes with plus, this comes with minus. That's it. Okay. Now, if you do similar argument in the general situation, the same ki kind of argumentation using this formula tells you that it's still true. Because if you're going to apply this to this element pi qi, you will see that you basically apply the same argument when the alphabet is just x's, pi's, and qi's. But uh, if you understood this argument, I say that the argument is uh, very similar to that. Okay, that's a special derivation. Okay. Uh, now. Sorry? Absolutely, yes. This I don't think it. I, I, I don't know what. I, I mean, I don't know what physical means here, but. Uh, huh? No, I can tell you what the meaning of this. It's just a little. Uh, we're going a little bit aside, but let me tell you. So, so you have this non commutative algebra. Now, let's consider a representation of this algebra in some matrices. <coughs> then, on the space of representations, to, to so you, you take representation of this guy uh, to the space of some matrices. Then, this is. Now, honest algebraic variety. On this algebraic variety, you can write a Poisson bracket. This Poisson bracket, uh, now you want to calculate this Poisson bracket. So, how do you do this? So, you write it in terms of the coordinates on your character variety. But then, uh, the way you write the formulas for this Poisson bracket will be kind of universal. So, these matrices which you use as the inputs will appear in a certain specific way. They, they appear in such a way that if you just take these formulas and substitute the axis for the matrices, then you get the honest, uh, let's say, bracket on the space of on the character variety. So, so you can say this as follows. So, this, this guy is a pretty important version of the fun fundamental group. And so, when I consider representation, I'm talking about a pretty important version of the character variety. And this Lie algebra I'm talking about is a pro it's a so some kind of version of the Teichmuller group. And so, all I'm saying here is that the Teichmuller group acts by uh, Poisson automorphism of this character variety, and uh, it gives you all automorphism. So, it's, it's, it's just a version of, of that statement. So, I take punctured surface, take the fundamental group, take pretty important completion, take character variety with arbitrary matrices uh, as a target, and uh, do all this game in such a way that matrices enter uh, in a kind of universal way. Then the, 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 the bottom line will be this construction. I, it's a theorem. Uh, okay. Uh, hmm? Is there a construction where there are no points in this that comes? Yeah, sure. Just, yeah. just delete the points. Huh? Yeah. Then you get a statement. I think that's what uh, Deling was asking, that if you have a curve which has no punches whatsoever, then uh, you are not going to get tensor algebra uh, with generators pi and qi. You're going to have a relation uh, that sum of pi and qi equal to 0. And so whatever we are doing here will be, presenting, will be preserving this relation. And so it will be the group of symplectic automorphisms of this guy. Th that, I think this was your question. Is that? <laughs> no? <laughs> OK. Yes. But what about Hamilton's equation? This is the space of all. Uh, so this 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 is a kind of pretty important game about Tachmiller group. And I'm just saying that the cyclic words they give you uh, Hamiltonians. How they give you Hamiltonians? Why is it cyclic? Because you take any cyclic word of this Ys, the matrices. Now you take you taking them in representation. Take product of them. Take a trace. This is a function on representation on the character variety. Now you take the Hamiltonian flow with respect to this function. You calculate it, so you get this result. Yeah. Huh? What? Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> OK. But now we want to get, I don't know whether I will do it, but at least I wanted to say what I want to do. Now I wanted to do uh, the main goal of today's lecture. I want to play with this Lie algebra and construct the, the, the correlator map on this Lie algebra. But did you explain why you get all the Oh, no, 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 I did not explain this. It's it's a, it's a, it needs to be proved. No, I didn't explain this, and I didn't. There was a theorem here, so I just explained one, one part that this kappa f's give me all derivations of a beta. If I impose this shuffle relation, they will cut me the derivation of the least subalgebra. Okay, now the main point is the following statement. Mm. It's a Hodge correlator map. 
So I claim, so I'm going to construct a map, probably not today, but still. Which takes this C T, uh, sorry, C Lee. Uh, and in fact, here I will have to dualize. I take dual space uh, related to any curve. And I want to map it just to real numbers. In fact, it will be i, but it doesn't matter. Just want to map it to real numbers. Now, what time you give me? We can go a bit late. Huh? We can go a little bit. Uh, if we finish at 4, but how long do you need? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Maybe at least, maybe what I can do, I can briefly uh, describe the construction and I can explain the construction next time, okay? So I want to define a map from, from this guy to real numbers. And so what I'm saying is that this map is a Hodge theoretic analog of the Galois action uh, on the material fundamental group, Hodge theoretic version to that. So in this case, it boils down just to map to real numbers. But still, it gives us, it, it's going to give us a lot, I mean, huge amount of inf information about the Galois action, about the material picture, because after that, we get some way to, 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 to see what happens uh, in the Hodge realization. So how it works. So you take, probably need to draw, draw a different circle. And I think I. So you now take the cyclic tensor product uh, of your homology group. And so now I just want to put them this way. So I put here some like S1, S2. Here I put some alpha 1, maybe alpha 2, S3, alpha 4. So this is just uh, points on my curve and homology classes. So they belong to H1 of x. OK? This is just harmonic or. Uh, anti holomorphic or anti holomorphic forms. And so, what I wanted to do, I wanted to assign to this picture number. So, how I assign to this picture number? So, I do something which looks like I'm doing some kind of Feynman rules. So, I draw any trivalent graph which I can exp put here. So, this is T as a three valent graph uh, decorated. by this h1 of x plus this delta functions, delta size. And uh, now I want to uh, produce a number for this guy. So I say that there is a green current. Which, be, which depends on tangential point. And its main property is it's a unique, like this unique uh, distribution, green function like that, which main property is a d bar d of this fellow is a delta function of the diagonal minus harmonic representative of the delta function of the diagonal. Now here, uh, I hope it's clear what do I mean by this. So delta function is just a current on x cross x. Now my x is just Riemann surface. So this is just a delta current. And this is just a harmonic representative of the same cohomology class. So altogether, this guy is homological to 0. And because of that, by dd bar lemma, I can solve the equation. When I solve this equation, because I'm living on compact curve, it's almost unique. It's unique up to a constant. And tangential base point tells me what the constant is. I'm going to skip this, but I'm just saying that tangential base point tells me uh, entirely unique function distribution on x cross x. And now I'm going to use it the following way. I just, I, I'm going to sketch the construction, and I will explain what it means next time, because I think it's a bit useful to see it in a brief version. <coughs> so, so I start from this 3t, and I assign to this some space I called x sub t which is just my curve x 
raised to power of vertices <coughs> of t. So this is just a product of copies of x. And so what I'm doing, so I'm taking some word w and this ct of gr, I can just gr w of h1 of x. We're now in beta realization, so it's just a vector space. And I assign to this some differential form. on this space x sub t across the twister plane. So this c2 is I call twister plane. And it's just a standard plane with coordinates z and w. Now, how I get the form there? So there is a construction. So I, I introduce operator called dc. So this is just wd minus z d bar plus z dw minus w dz. This is just a differential operator which uh, acts now on x cross twister plane. And so now I take the edges of my tree and so I apply this differential operator dc to the green function associated to one edge and so on to all of the edges. And also to whatever uh, harmonic or anti uh, holomorphic or anti-holomorphic form I see. So I, this is my differential form. So I call it kappa t of w. And then it comes with a sign which I'm not going to define for a second, for, for today. And so now the main claim that this is integrable. on x sub t cross c2. Now, what exactly written here? So as I said, so I start with this. So, so what, what does g e i mean? Yes, d, not d, but d g e i. So first of all, what does g e means? OK? So we have a graph like that. I will integrate. Uh, so so far, this is a form on the product of the axis over the vertices cross C two. Are you I'm decorating all of the vertices, which includes the interior vertices? Just like, I mean, I, I can't answer all questions no, in advance. So let me just go like like step by step. So let me first uh, answer questions, uh, Richard's questions. First of all, about decorations. So let me give one example, or maybe just do it here. Let's suppose you have H, which is internal H here E. Okay. Yes, yes, but uh, did you see that x sub t is x raised to the power of vertices of t? Yeah, I think the question was the interpretation of the phrase vertices of t. Ah, good. So you mean I do not, in, I, I do not include uh, those vertices which are decorated by holomorphic or anti-holomorphic differentials, but I do include those guys. I simply didn't have a chance to explain this. So this is my vertices. Hmm? Uh, it's just a v it's just a graph. So it, it's so in this case, I just consider x raised to the power of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's x to seven. So in this case, this is just x to seven cross c two. But this x to seven is a product of concrete x's, like one of the x's parameterized by this, by this, and so on. Okay. Now, is that better now? And so I'm about now to say this. So let's take an edge, for example, this one. Yes. So this edge defines your projection called P sub E from this x sub t to x cross x. Okay? Yes. On this x cross x, you have a distribution of function, green function G sub E. Okay? Uh, if this h is e, so it will be just g sub e, e, e i, whatever, e3. And so when I write this g e sub 3, it's abuse of notation, 
this is uh, inverse image of this green function. So are we excluding the edges that terminate? No, the no, we don't exclude them. So for example, here, I still get a green function, but this vertex is frozen. Yeah, but, but what if it ends at alpha i? Hmm? Uh, alpha i is a differential form, and so these edges I exclude. So now let me give you one example of this construction, OK? Or maybe, hmm? How are you labeling the edges? Hmm? How are you labeling the edges? Oh, it doesn't matter. So this is a separate story which we are not discussing because it, it gives me sign, but it doesn't matter at the moment. So is that OK for, some, for now? Hmm? That's just differential operator. So let's do example. Let's take a, the simplest possible tree. Well, the first example is a very trivial one. What if you have a diagram like that? This is S1, and this is S2. Then by definition, this we need to assign just g of S1, S2. It's just a number, basically. But when S is varies, it's a function. That's a trivial example. Let's do here a more interesting example. Hmm? Hmm? No, there is no D. Because it's, it's, going to, it's going to appear as this way. That's, that's how it's going to come up. So this. This term is going to tell me that I'm not, I should not. I get one form, but it's actually really green function. Okay, more complicated example. So I take a circle, and I take here one point and two differential forms, alpha and beta bar. G. I said, it's a green function, so I have a green function. So I'm saying that the construction in this case is almost trivial, so I just draw an edge like that and just assign to this edge green function. So it's just a number? Uh, just a number, yes, just a number. I made it artificial differential one form, but it's, uh, of course, it's, it's basically just a number, yes. Okay? okay? This is not, it's a telling example, but not very interesting as a first example. Now, this one is much more interesting. So uh, what do we need to do in this case? So we need to put, so first of all, with these edges, we don't do anything. The only edge which is uh, important edge is this one, because this is the one which is not ending but a differential form. Okay. So I'm writing integral green function of uh, x alpha wedge beta bar. This is what uh, the formula tells me. Uh, besides uh, this little fuss about this z's and w's, which in this case yet do not show up. So I have to decorate this by z dw means w d. Hmm? So if I have just one green function, so the formula reads as follows. Let's uh, take dc g e1, which alpha, which beta. If I have one essential edge, right? Uh, in this uh, simple example, xt is x cross x, which corresponds to this and this vertex. So uh, you imagine that your points, that you imagine that your curve varies in a family, that your points travel on the curve, and you have a family of the curve. Then you get a function on x cross x. If you insist that they are fixed points, then you just get a function, then you just get a number. Is that? And, and now, where does, maybe you'll explain this, but I didn't follow, where does G evaluated as S1, S2 come from? Who, who? Sorry. Where I does G evaluated as a pair S1, S2 come from? I mean, we. G, so, G, G, G. so I have a graph, I have a graph, which is just graph is one edge. Yes. 
Now, this graph uh, has both vertices, uh, external vertices, x1 and s2, OK? Now, by the rules of the game, so this is an edge. I have to assign to this edge green function, because to every essential edge, I assign the green function. This green function, by definition, is just that. No. Hmm? Yeah. No, it's a function of two variables. Yes. Yes, it's a function of two variables, and you may decide to freeze these variables or let them vary. It's up to you. So we're not but could you fix it at, at S1? I mean, no, S. I mean, is it a varying function over X or? or it depends or on it depends on what you want. So you want you may want to consider just a single curve with two punctures with with punctures as S1 and S2. Then, in this case, this is just a number, the green function evaluated at these two points, S1 and S2. It's just a real number. Which variables are you varying when you do your yeah. integral to get a number? Not these ones. Those are fixed. Not these ones, no. You fix that variables. Uh, there, there, are, there are variables inside which I'm going to. I mean, I guess the trouble is that I didn't really finish with the formal construction. Huh? <laughs> Yes, yes, uh, yes. Evaluated, I don't know what you want to call the first two variables. Uh, Evaluated as? X and Y or something. S1, S2, yes. X1, X2. Yeah, S1, no, S1. S1. S1 and S2 were your two points. Right? Yes. So I, 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 I have a suggestion. So may I explain this example? And I hope that the other one will be clear after. Huh? Hmm? I said that's ambitious. Yes. <laughs> Can I do this? Yes. This is a full case. Can I ask you what SI is? SI, so you have, OK. SI as a points on your curve. It's up to you to make a single <laughs> curve or a family of curves. If you have a single curve, it's just a fixed point on the curve. I keep putting a pole or something. But, but, but now we've got a function. I mean, somehow you can't. You take, you take a function of two variables, and you specialize this at two points. What's wrong about this? But where in this description was I told to specialize it at two points? So uh, in this description, so I have a tree. So the tree is this one. It's not a tree, it's just a single edge. OK? Yeah. That's my HE. So there is no contributions like that at all. No. And there is only simple, ex simple expression like that. And even this has to be uh, processed with little care, because the derivatives is going to be vanishing by. And so the only thing you're going to see, you're going to see this green function, x, y, evaluated at x equals s1 and y equals s2. and Richard, I simply didn't have time to tell you everything <laughs> about this picture. <laughs> hmm? I think the trouble is that you say you were to define a differential form on curly xt times t. Yes. We don't see curly xt, or rather we don't know what t is. He's got the s's in. So is t only the inner vertices? No, it's all vertices. But when I say differential form, in this case, it will be function along the s's. Hmm? What did you just say? In this case, it will be a. In which case? <laughs> <laughs> you just said something like that. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I just say what in this example I. Huh? In this case, it will be a function along the S's. Not a function, number. It will be number G of S1, S2. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Hmm? No, no. No, Richard, so, so, so let me try my last attempt. So if you're not satisfied, so uh, <laughs> too bad for me. Give up on me. Yeah. Sorry, so can I, can I no, no, I, I, I cannot talk with everybody. So may <laughs> maybe, maybe it would help. If I understand correctly, you have some copies of X that are labeled by the rest of the copies. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. It's, 
Yeah. No, no, no. Let, let's not go to the definition of this. Where, where did all this Omega get? No, no. <laughs> no, no. I, I so you give me, I so I give a complete definition, and then it takes uh, some time. Or I give you an example with an, uh, with a hope that you and understand. Don't see this D or you don't see it. Yes, absolutely. So uh, you don't see it. Yes. Let me just finish with this example. So, so I take, so I take this diagram, and so in this diagram there is only one edge, where one of the vertices of this edge uh, is uh, fixed. It's just my point S. Another vertex of this edge is a variable vertex. It's a vertex which is going to travel along uh, the whole curve. It's a variable x. And so what I do here, I produce a function. So this is a function where this s is fixed. And this x is a variable. OK? Hmm? All right? <laughs> Now I take this, this function in x and multiply it by differential form on x space and differential form b bar on the x space. And I integrate this over a set of complex points of x. That's it. So yes. In physics, when I talk about a correlator, you usually have a correlator, which is a point function of points of the space. And that's your s. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So, so, so I take, so I, I, I create a differential form on one copy of x on this one, which depends on this point s as a parameter. Okay. Where did this integral come from? <laughs> <laughs> so I produce differential form. I said this differential is integrable. So that was my statement. And I did not yet write the integral. So what I supposed to do? I supposed to integrate over x to t. Uh, of this, uh, so this is a form. It's on C two. But you better not look at this. You just <laughs> you better just say this is a differential form, and so forget about the Z twister plane, which is very important, but uh, additional delicacy of this construction. So I just integrate differential form. Okay. In vertices, yes, yes, yes. Oh, blah, 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 blah. right. X to inner. Huh? Inner, inner vertices, inner vertices, inner vertices. So there is a projection. So. And do summation over the graphs, yes, of course. Out. So there is a projection. So I integrate over the fiber of this projection. So in this particular case, so I, there is this out vertex here, this out vertex, and there's in vertex, in the vertex here. So first of all, I produce a form. So this, this is a form. Then I integrate this form over in the variable only. So I produce a, in this case, uh, it's an integral of a differential two form over curve. So I produce a number which depends on S. That's the, that's the output of the construction in this case. OK? So and is that clear now what I am doing? Yes, I think so. OK. And so I'm, so I'm doing this with each tree. So I do this integration, then, then take the sum over all trees. Then I will have to explain uh, what this twister plane does here. So this is a discussion which I'm certainly not going to uh, go on right now. You mean you want to see an example? Yes, of course. This is this is a rankin silberg integral. So in the case when your curve X is a modular curve, uh, compact uh, modular curve, and you ask is actually cusp, or I would better say linear combination of cusps, which is of degree 0. But let's say just cusp for now, a cusp. So now, then your alpha and beta are just way two modular forms. 
And so then the final comment is that this G uh, for a modular curve, this G of a cusp and X is essentially Eisenstein series. Uh, of x. This uh, at s equals 1. This statement needs to be treated with little care because Eisenstein series has exactly pole at this point. Huh? Better, so the the Green's function would come naturally at 0. Hmm? Uh, uh, it's logarithm of the Ziegler unit, yes. So I don't know how you. Hmm? But I, again, I'm not, I don't want to go to the discussion. So what I'm doing, I'm evaluating this uh, green function on a difference of cusps. So I take difference of cusps, then, huh? then it cancels the poles. That's why, yeah. So I get Eisenstein series, which is basically logarithm of a Ziegel unit. If I do degree 0 cusp here. And then I'm doing integral of the logarithm of Ziegel unit multiplied by, uh, in terms of modular forms, f dz wedge g dz bar. So f and g is just differential, it's just modular forms. And this is a rankin solberg integral by definition. And you can have n levels, not just two. Hmm? The whole point is you can define it for. Yes, but if it. Any definitely. I Yes, yes, I can consider now Eisenstein series, so I can consider modular forms of arbitrary weight n. But if I want to get them in this uh, format as a correlators, I have to uh, go from the uh, uh, motivic fundamental group made nilpotent to motivic fundamental group made completed at GL2. And I have to complete it at the representation of GL2, which corresponds to the weight. Then I get precisely, then the definition runs uh, the same way, and it recovers uh, the modular forms of uh, high weights. But it's not, it's not a motivic fundamental group made important as was subject of today's lecture.